Welcome to the Dark Zone, an adventure racing podcast. So we, we picked a challenging little corner, um, but we see it working every day. We see it absolutely playing out, you know, with the way that these girls take lessons and carry themselves differently after they've had access to this program. Okay, you people sit tight, hold the fort and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you, thanks a lot. Welcome to the Dark Zone and Adventure Racing Podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. The Dark Zone usually focuses on adventure racing topics and brings racers and race directors and fans on to talk about their work. From time to time, we, we like to push outside our comfort zone and invite people who live their lives in the spirit of adventure racing and who do things that are challenging and that are important. Our sport is just a sport, right? We chase flags in the woods and there's maps and there's compasses and that's great. And then there are people who do much more important things than us. And on that spirit, we've invited Marina Legree of Ascend Leadership Through Athletics onto the show today. Ascend or Ascend Athletics works primarily out of Afghanistan and is a leadership development organization for young women. Marina, to, to start the conversation, once again, thanks for being here. Talk to our, our, our listeners about Ascend Leadership Through Athletics. What's the organization and what can we learn about it? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. What a... Uh... Very cool audience that you have with this adventure racing, which I hadn't really known about until getting in touch with you. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to talk to some people who also treasure adventure. Um, Ascend is definitely an adventure. Um, we are founded in order to create opportunities for young women to develop their leadership potential through sports and specifically through mountaineering and rock climbing. And we operate in places where gender disparity is at its most severe. So Afghanistan um, may come straight to mind. And we're also starting a program this year in Pakistan. When I looked at the, the website and I saw your, your headshot on the website, someone who's the founder of an organization, of, a, of an NGO, a, non, a non-government organization, tends to not have their headshot be them with a pack on their back and clearly strolling through the mountains. I'm assuming that you were an outdoor person first and you backed into Ascend. I don't think you left your corporate job somewhere and became this. What's your, what's your background like? Yes, I grew up in Washington State in the Columbia River Gorge. So, and I grew up on a small farm. So outdoor adventure was my thing from birth. Um, my dad used to take me canoeing from before I could even walk. And we, you know, walked around the property taking care of things. And my dad was into running marathons and some other sort of endurance sports. So we watched that growing up. Um, and then I moved overseas pretty early in my career. I wanted to do international development work. And that took me to some interesting places. And along the way, I always found my adventures, but not formally. So I think that's what appeals to me about adventure racing. What an interesting combination of the things that I, at least that I tend to, to love to do. And Afghanistan came along um, and I've been working there since 2005. And when I, when I got there, I was sent to, not to Kabul, where most people spend their development careers, but to Badakhshan province, which is in the extreme Northeast of the country. And in 2005, there was no pavement in the whole province. It was quite uh, removed and quite rural and full of mountains. And so that that's kind of where the attachment began to that place in that country. And so so clearly growing up, you're, you were exposed to the outdoors through your family and Columbia River Gorge. I mean, it's tough to find a more beautiful place in America in which to live. You were pulled into exactly. international development and, and your, your path took you into Afghanistan. And that's where you found your, your home. That's where you found your passion. Did you the, the adventures through international development and what's interesting right now, and I think a large part of our talk is going to be comparing adventure racing to the work that you do. There's a bit of a Venn diagram, like I mentioned before we spoke, that that comes alive here, that clearly you're driven by a sense of you're willing to push into places that people who want lives of comfort and want lives of simplicity 
won't necessarily bring themselves to. And I think that kind of corresponds to adventure racing because this is, first of all, this is a sport. This is international development. We don't, we want to make certain that we're recognizing the disparity between the two experiences we're talking about. But clearly there's a part of you that, that looks forward to and searches out this kind of challenge. What do you make of that? Well, I think when you say sport, I, I didn't talk about that part of my development, I guess, or my heading down this path. Um, I grew up in the gorge in a very small town. Sports were just, um, I feel like my character and my self-esteem was really formed by playing team sports, um, softball, basketball, and it, with, you know, small town, you play everything, right? And I was usually the team captain. I was really into it. And that was my leadership experience as a kid. And graduating from that, and when I left that after college, I pretty much went directly into the development space. And it's just, it slaps you in the face when you see that that opportunity to play sports and to have that path to your personal development is completely absent for a huge number of people in the world, people being primarily girls. And the the kind of injustice of that was just like screaming at me in Afghanistan that, you know, that that's how I became who I am. That's what brought me joy. And and they, the girls there weren't even able to freely move around. Um, so none of that was available to them. So the sport, the love of sport and that, that spirit of knowing who you are and like what you're capable of physically and as part of a team, that's, that's what I think it's got to be shared by anybody that's into adventure racing as well. Um, you just want to push the limits. You want to see what your physical self can accomplish. And then you make it a team thing and it changes how you look at other people and how you're able to form bonds and trust and all of those things that are absolutely essential. And um, I wanted to open a door to that for, for Afghan girls and so others. It, so so it, it sounds like, you know, very often in first off, you're this is very quickly becoming an event racing podcast. So good job. I appreciate you doing that because the things you touched on there, you're, you're a wise woman, Marina Legree, because you're, you're seeing the connections right away. You spoke about your childhood and the, and the, the sports that you played, the things that you did, and you are who you are because of those things, right? Because you had experience of that as a younger child, it's a small town, you do all, you, you had leadership positions there. You recognize that you became a fully formed person because of those team-based experiences. And therefore, when you saw them absent in other people's lives, it felt very shocking to you. And mm -hmm. and I, I, I make no challenge to be a geopolitical expert, but I, I do recognize that traditionally speaking, Afghanistan and women's rights has always been a challenge there. Even in the best of times, there was an incredible discrepancy between the which men were treated and women were treated. And I'm assuming that kind of that kind of chewed at you a little bit. Right? You showed up there and looked around and you were like, well, wait a minute here. This isn't this isn't the way it's supposed mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and physically you go a little nuts too. Like I had never been constrained in the way that I was constrained there because there wasn't like an expat community where you all go, you know, let loose together. Um, it was a rural place with, I was the only American. So you don't get to go running. You don't get to like shoot hoops or do anything. You, I just took up yoga for the first time in my life there because I, I was constricted to inside in my room night and day. And I lived upstairs and worked downstairs. So, you know, you take away that freedom of movement and that ability to just move your body and feel healthy. And it, it does, um, it eats away at your mental health really quickly. Um, so that piece too, you know, having lived it myself and I was there for three years in that, in that rural province. So it wasn't like I was just passing through, you know, I was really, I was right. in it for three full years. Right. And it sounds so, like you were relatively young when you were there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I so, was. And and at the time in my life where most of my friends were, you know, partying and dating and living in major cities in places, I, I was out there. In, in Northwest <laughs> Afghanistan, working with in international yeah. development. Wow. And and yes. not only and so not only culturally were there headwinds, but there's also it sounds like there were logistical headwinds. You mentioned the lack of the the paved roads and, and that it's a part of the world that felt very far away from everything there. And I'm assuming it. this wasn't during a date, the time in which you opened up your phone, grabbed the satellite signal, and you were talking to somebody. You were really out there. Yeah, you're pretty out there. Yep. Yeah. And, and all of the relationships that you make locally are what makes you succeed. So that's where you invest your time. And um, I really had a, a unique and really special opportunity, especially in hindsight, 
to bond with the communities that we worked with. There wasn't a military element at that time. And it wasn't like Taliban versus foreigners. It was just more of a rural situation. There was a lot of lawlessness and poverty. Um, so obviously when you're bringing development dollars, people appreciate that and they welcome you with open arms. Um, that's mostly what happened. And so in the course of doing that, you know, you get to talk to people and see what they're really up for. And we worked specifically with girls a lot too, and they're just desperate for opportunities to better themselves. And so that was, again, there, there's a lot of very valid ways to better yourself. And in a country where literacy is so low, maybe you should start with that. And education obviously is, is the key to the future, but my particular brand of what I felt that I could bring was sports. So that's what I went with. We did a couple things that shocked certain people. Um, like early in our time in Afghanistan, it was 2016, we had our first male volunteer, an American, go to Afghanistan, which everyone was like, you want to do what? You know, It just flies in the face of all norms and everything because he was also older, but not old enough to be safe, you know, from these girls in the in the eyes of a very conservative culture. Um, but it was great. He was a wonderful teacher, really caring guy. And I think it was a positive experience all around. So we repeated it with another wonderful volunteer from the UK. Um, but anyway, having that mixed gender and that exposure and the interactions between the two, it's, you, you can't never do that. Like you really have to build that into your approach. And especially as we're as we're trying to do deeper work to shift the gender balance, um, the male side of things cannot be ignored. And we'll see what we're able to do in Pakistan. It's, it's going to be significantly more open um, to some mixing and we'll be able to do things like certify rock climbing instructors, women who can then teach mixed classes and come at it that way where women will have you know, world recognized certifications and a skill that's really in demand and respected, and then they'll be able to teach and it shifts things quite a bit. And, and once, you have a, once you have a subject matter expert and they're very good at it, gender sometimes falls to the side, right? The If you're good that's at this right. thing and you need- it, Absolutely. Right. It's the skill yeah, that drives it. It totally does. People just, yeah, people just want to climb and they're not hung up on it, whether it's a boy or a girl that's climbing. And we actually did do that in, in Afghanistan. So a lot of times we would have boys, littler boys, but up to like 12, 13, that would come hang out and watch our girls who tended to be 18, 19, 20. Um, and sometimes we let them, you know, harness up and try it, you know, when we had girls there who were safely certified. So then you have, you know, an 18 year old Afghan girl teaching a 12 year old Afghan boy how to climb and he's having the best day of his life. And that makes an impression in his mind that we hope is lasting, that this girl had this cool skill that she taught him. And it's a power shift in how he's probably normally viewing girls. And, and there's, and there's that. once again, there's an adventure racing dynamic that exists there too, that when you're on the other side of a race, whether it be a six hour race, 24, three day, five day, 10 day race, when that experience, when you're on the side of that experience and you go through that challenge, you're a different person on the other side, right? And to your point, Absolutely. when that young man work with that, with the, what's more skilled, older female, when he left that experience with her, he couldn't help but see the world differently because of his interaction with her. And and I and I think, and I don't want to read too much into what Ascend does, and I want you to please walk me towards away from this. It's the experience of working with multiple people inside sport, inside athletics, that you feel will drive change inside of people. Like that's your venue to get people to become different people. Yes, that's exactly it. We call it the crucible experiences that we can offer where people come. And, and for us, it's usually um, it's like backcountry camping trips where they also do rock climbing training. But it is a crucible experience for a girl who may have never left her home for the night. And that's a huge leap of faith for the parents as well to let her out of their sight for a night, especially if there are males around, which there there have been multiple times. But then everybody goes through that experience and they have a blast. And there's there's always like abject fear. And we get these hilarious questions like people are always really worried about bears. <laughs> it's like there are no bears Everywhere. in Afghanistan. Everywhere. We're very close, but right. <laughs> like you're worried about bears and they cry. You know, there's like it's a huge emotional thing. But um, <laughs> but uh, then they get through it and they have this kind of swagger when they're through the other side and they've done something really cool. And I'm seeing now like the girls that were in our program, say 2017, 2018, 
and they've left Afghanistan, they've been through a traumatic experience in the last couple of years, they're still identifying with those experiences, posting pictures about it with their teammates. And like, it's, it, it's some kind of formative experience that really lasts. It's not, it's not as hardcore as adventure racing, like the actual, it's, it's mostly just going through the camping and the, you know, you live outdoors for five days. They've definitely never done that before. And a little rock climbing and rappelling is scary. (laughs) And you're a different person on the other side. And so I think that that's another Mm -hmm. in the, in the, the Venn diagram of what we're talking about here. I agree with you that those experiences for those young women and getting out of their comfort zone and out of their homes makes them into different people. And it's, and it's very, very powerful to go through that. And I will tell you, um, the, the, the central tenet of the dark zone is all about the stories that drive us, right? I mean, when it, when an adventure race mm-hmm. ends, and I, I bet you've had this experience following your clinics when you're working with, with, with your, with your athletes, the race ends, right? Never crosses the finish line and the race director is doing the, the final results and everyone's kind of waiting around. Everybody is buzzing over the pizza and over the beverages. And they're telling their stories of, I approached the checkpoint from this way and I fell down that hill and I climbed that really well and I ran out of food. And it's the stories that drive the common experience in that spirit, which really is, is what the adventure with with the dark zone really is focused on. What are some touchstone stories that when people ask you to tell stories about ascend and the work that you do, you mentioned the, the, the young women getting out of their homes for the first time. What else is the stories that you carry forward as you tell your story? So this is actually, I'm going to give you a story that I never tell but it comes straight to mind because again, with the sadness that kind of struck Afghanistan in the last year and a half, two years, um, we have to think about also all the good things that definitely happened. So on one of our trips, so we normally did four to five backpacking camping trips with rock climbing mixed in um, every year. So we take a group of 12 to 24 girls, do the tents, do the pretty strenuous hike in, all that stuff. So we're doing that in, I think it was 2017 and um, we went hiking. We wanted to go up to this um, little glacier. And so we did that. And on the way we passed this beautiful little pond. And again, I'm from Washington state. Like I grew up swimming in the little Creek on our property is always cold and the Pacific there it's, you know, dare each other to stay in for more than 60 seconds, you know? So cold water, you, you got to go in it though. You have to try. This stuff is coming straight off the glacier. So on the way back, I told the girls like this little pond, it's perfect. It's like surrounded by little grassy hill, hills and all that is really nice and isolated. There's nobody around. So we went back to camp and I was like, who's going to go with me? We're going to go swim and just jump in. So I, I was surprised, but I think it was six of the girls hiked back up there with me. And we all went skinny dipping in this pond, <laughs> glacial water, and it, they just had a blast. And so did I, and we were freezing and we still had, you know, three days to be camping there, but I'll never forget that. Like, again, you just strip away all of the pretenses and the cultural habits and this and that, and everybody just wants to jump in the beautiful pond and, it's, <laughs> and have and a great it's, time. And, and when all <laughs> said and done, it's about, it's about kids having fun with adults that they could trust. Right. The fact that you yep. could accompany them and yes. you could shepherd them literally through that experience and say, listen, and they would never thought of it without you. So you need the adult to be like, hey, I'm going to do this thing. Who's in with me? And they're like, well, if we trust her, she's doing right. it. Let's go do it. And they would never have done it otherwise. Yep. Right. And and that's the power that we see of that's the right. work that you're doing. Right. And, you know, the, and there's so many metaphors and visualizations. Right. The person with the flashlight walking in front of the kids, guiding the way, walking shoulder to shoulder with them. And it, it sounds as if there's a, there's a, there's a sense of joy that comes out of the work that Ascend does that, that when you cut it to its core, it's about young women who deserve opportunities and chances, chances that you were afforded. And as a result, you're dedicated towards giving it to them. And I, and I think that's admirable, right? And that's, that's and that's right, what right. we, and, and not to make the listeners roll their eyes, but once again, there's sort of the adventure racing experience that comes across is time and time again, as adventure racing grows in popularity and more people do it and enjoying it, they're, they're searching out for people to mentor them and bring them through. And on the Facebook discussion mm-hmm. groups and in the message boards, people are always like, I am new to adventure racing. Can I, can I race this? Who could race with me? There's an adventure race teammate finder page. So you're modeling a lot of those human experiences that we see ourselves in our sport, just people with more experience bringing other people along. Absolutely. If you have just somebody to follow, most people have no trouble giving it a go. <laughs> you just right. need somebody to do it. 
Yeah, exactly. Yep. Just get, get out there and go and, do and it. That's, that's our value added. I think, it's, yeah, we just, we go with confidence. We push aside the fears and the barriers to it and we just go. And thankfully we were able to go safely every time and, we never had right. problems. And, it, and it's, and, and once again, too, the most important thing that you do in your work is that you just got started. Like, like you didn't, the path wasn't clear. There was no set plan. There wasn't a 10 point plan. It was like, listen, we have, we have capital and we have smarts resources. We have visas, we have paperwork, and we're just going to go do this job. And we're going to figure it out along the way. And it sounds like that really was a lot of what you did when you were there. Yeah, actually the, the first goal there was, it was a very basic goal and there wasn't a detailed plan to achieve it, but I wanted to train and support the first Afghan woman who would climb the highest mountain in the country, which is a really high one, by the way, it's 24,580 feet. So the thing is really big right. <laughs> and uh, it had been climbed in 2009, a couple of Afghan men climbed it with some uh, very strong support from some French mountaineers. So that just got me thinking, you know, it's doable. These guys were not technical climbers at all, um, but with the right support, they did it. And it was a huge, you know, moment of pride for a country that really needed some sort of mm -hmm. joy and, mm -hmm. and pride. So, but I also just thought, okay, if a man can do it, so can a woman. Right. Where is and, she? Where is she? Then, Let's go get her. Exactly. And how did that work out? How did that play out for you? Well, it, so that was 2009. I didn't even send until 2014 mm -hmm. because, well, you know, in the interim, I did a lot of research about the at similar attempts and women climbers around the world. And there's a lot of tokenism that put me off. Um, I didn't want to just, you know, you don't just put a woman on a mountain and crow about it. And then, then what? What's the point? Right. And what right. is she doing to share that that victory with others? Um, so I didn't want to just have it be about one person. It needed to be, you know, I'm I'm trained in international development, so you need to like think about the larger group and mm -hmm. the larger trends behind it. So then it became starting a nonprofit, which is a much more daunting thing, and making it last, and also making sure that you know there would be one that would summit this mountain, but then there would be every year others following behind. Gotcha. So you didn't want to just have, have one person short rope to the top and say, oh, look, we climbed, rah, 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 take your photo, move on. You wanted to create a situation which it was done repeatedly. Exactly. Okay. And where it, anybody that sees what she did sees that she's attached to something meaningful and that she's, you know, reaching out a hand to help the next women come right. after her, not, right. not selfishly, you know, promoting herself. Right, which, right. Sometimes does happen. <laughs> yeah. You, you, and you see that in every single sport activity, there's always going to be people who they want to use a certain activity to promote themselves. And adventure racing is not free from that, right? Adventure racing is a human activity and there will always be bad actors, people who come at it the wrong way and try to take what they can out of it and leave nothing behind. So you're, you're, you're spot on there. Um, before we started recording, I, I indicated to you that I, I didn't want to spend um, all of our time talking about the last several years in Afghanistan and what, and what life was like for Ascend and life was like for, for the young women who access your, your program. And, and I, I wanted to focus on the, use the word joy before, right? A lot of good things happened. And it was a, in many ways, it was wonderful. And it's been very challenging, right? And that's just sort of the, the, the lesson of life, right? It, it's going to be ups and downs, there'll be waves. The, the, with, with the fall of, of Afghanistan and the rise of the Taliban and the work that you did, there's definitely a story to be told there about how hard to send work to take care of the young women who were under their care. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that was um, a project we didn't want to take on. We never wanted it to happen. Um, but yes, when the Taliban came, our staff, our instructors, our participants, our alumni, they all reached out for help. And we had a short debate at SN because about what to do, whether to be involved at all in these evacuation efforts, because we're not sponsored by any government. I happen to be American and we're registered in the US, but we don't have any ties to the US government. We're not funded by any government. so nobody owes us visas and you can't evacuate people without putting them somewhere. So, and all of those people that you saw on the news getting on the planes had some claim to a visa. Mostly they were former military interpreters or employees of the U S government in some way. And they're very large families in most cases. Um, so yeah, we, we, but, but we couldn't ignore the, the reality. Like it seemed pretty clear that Whatever happened with the Taliban, it was going to be a massive upset in daily life and educational opportunities and progression for our girls who are at such a critical stage of their 
life development. We take girls between the ages of 15 and 22. And in hindsight, again, it's been um, it's been a year and a half. Nothing's moved. Like it's only gotten worse. So any girl that's living there, her education has been interrupted. She doesn't know if she's ever going to be educated again. Um, she can't move around freely. So those are massive losses. And also people just lose hope. So we didn't want that to happen to our girls who we had encouraged down this path of aiming high, you know, be different, claim your space, be you. <laughs> and they would just be crushed. And even if there was a lot of talk at first about Taliban hunting it down and killing people that were doing things like ascend. And I, that not a lot of that really came to fruition, but what is absolutely true is it's, it kills their spirit. It absolutely crushes their soul. I was just going to say that when we, it, everything had to be really fast, right? We knew that it was sort of now or never and this sympathy and confusion also on the part of a lot of governments and just people around the world, it would last for a little while. Right. So we had to jump in right. and we had a couple, um, a couple lucky strokes. Like we had a supporter in Ireland who reached out and created a partnership with another supporter. End of the story was that the Irish government gave us 20 visas. And then we had to figure out who we'd give those visas to while we're trying to shuffle people around. We also have um, an Ascend supporter who, actually a few, um, who were in critical places to to rescue people and put them on planes and it was it was quite dramatic um i'll never be and able when to you use the word rescue you're not publicly. you're not being hyperbolic i literally rescue people like we have a spot on a plane and i'm oh, going to no. get you oh. out of here yeah we, we had a very nasty situation where our country manager who is norwegian um and like six foot one i think blonde hair blue eyed talented climber teacher she needed to get out like immediately. So we were very worried about that. Um, and she attempted on her own to go to the airport and reach the Norwegian forces, which didn't work out well at all. She was assaulted and like at risk of real injury. Um, so one of our supporters literally plucked her out of her place and put her on a plane back to Norway. So, and, and also that open gates for our staff who were able to get on planes. And it was such a dicey game. You know, everybody was passing around information about what gate might be open at what moment. And it all happened at, you know, three in the morning, cobble time, because you had to avoid the crowds that were making things impossible during the day. There was a looming threat of an ISIS attack all the time. And we were constantly getting intel about which gate state, you know, you would get intel that this gate will be open at this time, send your people there. And then, so you're texting them in the middle of the night, go to this gate. And then five minutes in, as they're on their way on foot through the dark streets of Kabul with Taliban checkpoints being set up and you don't know what's going to happen. And then you get another text, ISIS threat at that gate, pull back. So then you have to tell those people, go back. And those people have left their homes. They've sold their stuff. They've, their plan, there is no going back, you know? So it was a very dramatic decision point for anybody that asked us for help and for us to jump into that fray and to try to really shift the course of people's lives in that way. Um, and in the end, looking back now, I have no regrets. I would do it all over again because, again, it's just like the, the death of opportunity to live freely um, for those girls. So, And most of them are they're, they're living in eight different countries around the world. There's 134 people that we were able to get out um, and they're studying, they're working, they've learned languages, they're, they're making their new lives. And actually just today, I um, talked to the owner of a climbing gym in, in British Columbia, um, who's giving us a nice big discount for a couple of the girls that are resettled there so they can go climb. So moving on, you know, up the hierarchy of needs a bit. It, it sounds like the, the, the Ascend family was, was, was dispersed from Afghanistan and landed at a, you know, 134 different experiences and people landed in all these different countries. And what you brought to them through your your philosophy and through his philosophy is radiating now in these communities, right? If you think about it, the 134 people that you talked about, 134 different stories that they're telling at 134 different tables, just like this. And as a result, it's 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 spreading further and wider through that experience. Um, you, you, your, your tale there reminded me of a, an excellent book, and I think there's a parallel here, 
Rebecca Solnit is a wonderful writer, and she wrote a book called A, a Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster. And and the viewers can see, but you nodded your head when I mentioned that. Have you heard of her book before? Not that one, but I've read her other, some of her other work. Love her. Yeah, the, 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 the core premise of, of, of her book, and, and I'll link to it in the show notes, and people should read it, is that she talks about how it, there's this interesting human condition that when when things happen, when things are at their worst, and she mentions Katrina, she mentions September 11th in New York City. And I think if she wrote more in that book, she might talk about, about Kabul and, and during this time, that how when things are at their worst, people are at their best. And everything kind of falls away. Yeah. Like nothing else really matters. It's yeah. about the person in front of you and taking care of them. Absolutely. And it was amazing to see how some of our people perform under that kind of stress. Um, like my admin finance officer, who was not one of the you know athletic instructors, but she was just a total boss. Like she was so calm. And she was one of the first people who was like, she was sitting on a bus that was searched by Taliban fighters. She surreptitiously took photos of it and sent them to me. And like my heart stopped because it's just like the, um, you know, it looks like the boogeyman. They're just like the caricature of the bad Taliban searching the bus. And uh no problem. She just keeps her cool and she's helping me organize, you know, buying plane tickets when they became available from there's a Pakistani airline that let us, you know, buy tickets and just put people on in a civilized manner as well. Anyway, she just she handled all that from her phone as she's dealing with, you know, leaving most of her family behind potentially forever. She, yeah, just just handled the business and people people shine sometimes when Amazing, right? Impressed. People, they, they they simply rise to the occasion, and and you know, and, yeah. and in the context of your conversation, adventure racing means nothing. It means nothing. It's a sport in which people run around in the woods and they find checkpoints. And so, to make even a comparison is, is absurd. <clears throat> but to your point, the idea that like when 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 things are tough and things are hard, people find out who they truly are, and they do it through example, and they do it through philosophy, like those people rose to the level of what a sense set for them. Like there was a philosophy that that predated what happened in with the Taliban in, in Kabul. And when the time came, they activated all that philosophy and they brought it to life and they, they took care of those 134 people that you talked about. Um, and and I, I will say yeah. for the listeners out there, this is how I came across your work. Um, we followed very closely in my home. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed with it, with a wife that is very focused on women's rights issues and pays attention to that. And we came across a send with all the news there. And um, she was so, so impressed by the work that you're doing that day, that our family was able to, to help you in some manner during that time. And we were we were fortunate and blessed to be able to do that. Um, I, I, I wanna talk about this now a bit because I, I wanna shift to what you're doing now, but I also wanna bring into the conversation that if people are listening to this and if they wanna help us and they wanna do their work, and, I, and I'll, I'll say this for you in some way, capital resources, donations, I would assume are the biggest fuel that you have right now um but alongside that there's other things to do how can people reach out to your organization what are the what are the avenues that you have whether through social media or your website or things like that please tell our audience about that sure oh you're just giving me a wonderful chance to plug our first u.s based athletic fundraiser which we um it's it'll be april 29th in it's about an hour west of washington dc and near Paris, Virginia. It's on our website, ascendathletics.org. And then on the get involved tab, there's like a events. Um, so all the details are there. We're, we use race roster so people can easily sign up for that. You can sign up as a team or as an individual. Anyway, it's a hike along the Appalachian Trail. So um, we're, we're hoping that will become an annual thing and hopefully gather a mix of people who will be, you know, amazingly athletic and do it in record time. And also lots of mere mortals who just want to raise a little money. <laughs> so we'll have different uh, lengths and challenges for it. But yeah, please come to that. And I would just say too, we're tiny, like Ascend is still very small. And uh, tell your friends, you know, follow us on social media. See, we, we do a pretty good job keeping content coming through so you can see what we're up to and share it talk about it, like getting some name recognition and some awareness has been a huge help. And actually the silver lining of the crisis in Afghanistan is that more people did notice who we were. Um, and that that can eventually open doors to foundations that might support us and things like that, that essential to the long-term, you know, health and sustainability of the organization. So super helpful. Um, we, do, we do monthly donations are a big thing for us. Um, 
you know, if you believe in what we're doing, set up a recurring donation starts at $10 a month. Um, those things really matter because they also, you know, so I'm the executive director. I see those figures every day and it's a signal to me that people believe in us and I can plan. I can make decisions confidently that we've got the resources. So all that stuff is a huge help. The, the, um, the situation leaving Kabul and getting 134 people out was the big bright light of the work that you did, right? And then to your point, you said earlier, attention kind of goes someplace else, right? Human nature takes off. What is the current state of your programs? What countries are you working in? What programs are you offering? Tell us a bit, like, like at this moment today, what does it send up to? Sure. So today, thankfully, we're looking forward a lot. Um, we, when we evacuated those people, we committed to a resettlement program. So there was no point for us in just flinging 18 year old girls out of their country's boundaries and then letting them hope for the best. <laughs> like we had to set up partnerships and see it through that all concluded. So we've been very busy with that um, in eight countries that concluded December 31st of 2022. Close the book. We have an alumni association now where these girls can have activities together um, and stay connected. But our focus is totally now on our program, our core program, the way we've always run it. Leadership through athletics. Like, let's get back to the mountains. Let's do climbing. Let's train instructors. So um, we're opening in Pakistan and we'll be operating out of Skardu in Gilgit, Baltistan in the north, which is an absolutely gorgeous place. And it's everybody that's going to go to K2 goes through there. And there's like you can't go out the door without tripping over something awesome to go and do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's going to be the main focus for 2023. Our instructor trainee program kicks off April 10th up there. So we'll be training uh, about 15 young women who will be the instructors in the future. And that starts them down a path where they can obtain certifications like single pitch instructor for rock climbing, and they can get various certifications that let them be a well-rounded outdoor instructor. And then uh, they'll be teaching the others. So we're they're just getting off the ground there with all of that. And concurrently, we're rebuilding in Afghanistan, which we kept our physical assets there, but we evacuated all of the people. So we're working with new partners to do training that's really focused on mental health. And there's, of course, a physical wellness element to that, too. And we have to be pretty creative about how we do that. Um, but that's that's what we're doing in Afghanistan. So you won't see any mountaineering there anytime soon. You'll see plenty of that in Pakistan. But uh, we'll keep on chugging in both. Credit to you for holding the Afghanistan presence, right? The idea of saying that the, the country and your commitment to them is not going anywhere, right? Because it would be an easy decision strategically just to say that Afghanistan is, is a closed shop and we have to move on to someplace else. But you're working inside the, the really challenging parameters set up by the people that are governing the country currently. Um, yep. if, if the if the adventure racing community, first things first, I guarantee that somebody listening in the Delmarva region is going to sign up to take part in your event west of DC. I, I, I can almost, I can name them and I won't do it because there's a vibrant adventure <laughs> racing community down there. So don't be surprised. And also don't be surprised awesome. if growing out of this, if somebody contacts you and if, and I, I know who you are, you're thinking about it right now. If we want to host and ascend athletics team at some of our races and want to put a team together. Um, <laughs> That'd be awesome. That would be fabulous. Yeah. Yes. And you know what I didn't say earlier, you're kind of underselling the adventure racing community for, you know, in comparing with this like enormity of us dealing with this crisis in Afghanistan, but not, not the AR community, but the climbing community has been a treasure for us. Like, and where, where we've been able to settle girls and introduce them to climbers. And then sometimes it's the climbers themselves that have really opened the doors and, and actively done all the work to these girls are thriving, you know, because there is a special sense of community in people that I'm making assumptions about adventure racing, but I've certainly seen it in, in climbers. Like they're connected. They're people who are really, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but they have been absolutely wonderful to these girls and giving our girls a chance to, um, to have an outlet from the, the grind of building a new life and also the trauma of leaving families behind and all that stuff. They get to go out climbing with people who care and who get it, you know, and that's, I could see that being um, a really cool place for some Ascend girls to make, to discover the AR world. Yeah, it, well. it exists. You know, climbing is a, we're, we're all in the same family, right? Different siblings, same family. 
You know, we, we have a, yeah. a love of the, a love of the outdoors. There's a, there's a common bond. There's community, there's shared challenge, there's shared risk, right? That's part of the deal. There's shared stories. And mm -hmm. so I think that you're going to find through this exposure to the art community that a lot of those same things that exist in the, in the climbing community now, will you find will exist in the art community. Um, you, Marina, you've been very generous with your time and I want to be respectful of, of what you have laying ahead of you in the rest of your day. Before we say goodbye to our audience, uh, is there something that I, I left out something I didn't bring up that you wish that I had asked you about? On a broader level, um, we work to empower girls who become women who take their, we want them to feel confident to take their space. And this is our particular way to do that. But I, I mean, I, I really like to see us as occupying just a little corner of that larger movement for improving the gender relations in our world. So we, we picked a challenging little corner, um, but we see it working every day. We see it absolutely playing out, you know, with the way that these girls take lessons and carry themselves differently after they've had access to this program. So I guess I would just like to, um, you know, shout out to all of the organizations that are doing similar work, but in different ways that are all kind of striving towards that same mission. Thank you, Marina, for being on The Dark Zone. We appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing a sense story with us. Listeners, be sure to check out the show notes for all the relevant links. We know you have a lot of choice out there in today's podcasting world, and we appreciate you spending time with us. Feel free to send a message to me, brian at ardarkzone.com. And if you like what you hear, please leave a review or a rating or anything on your streaming platform of choice. Thanks and be safe out there.